open the meeting of the Maple Run Unified School District Board of Directors for February 1st, 2023. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to make sure that we have established a quorum. I believe with the number of members we have, we need seven for a quorum. And we have six, is that correct? So I would just suggest you that we need five for a quorum. Is it five or four? It's, actually. it's actually, no, sorry. We have two down, so we're down to seven. So we need four for a quorum. That's correct. I misspoke. I, I said we have seven members, four for a quorum, so we're all set. <clears throat> yeah. um, and then uh, the next item, should we do uh, introductions, Bill, for people that don't know us? now or wait until what's your pleasure i know there's people in the room uh maybe we can let's get the meeting going and then you can decide where you'd like to do that okay let's do the agenda review do you want to call the meeting to order nilda thank you very much oh you did oh i missed it sorry i can do it again if you want but i did um we'll do the agenda review uh, does anyone have any uh, items that they need to add, subtract, uh, move on the agenda, as far as you know? Hearing none, um, we're going to go to the Pledge of Allegiance. Video here. Okay, please stand and join me for a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, next thing I'd like to do is um, in response to the incident from January 31st, last night, I would like to read the following press release into our records. <clears throat> All of us in the Maple Run community are shocked and saddened by last night's death of Russell Giroux after a physical altercation during a basketball game at the Alberg Community Education Center. We extend our condolences and sympathies to his family and friends. Since our students observed the altercation, we are working in the next days to support our students and families in dealing with the consequences of the altercation and Mr. Giroux's death. This morning, we were informed, we informed our school staff of the incident and put immediate supports in place for the teachers. The Maple Run Unified School District condemns the violence that occurred during the basketball game. We expect better from our communities. Fighting and violence are wholly <clears throat> inconsistent with the behavior we encourage and support. We always seek to foster a positive learning environment in school and at school events for our students. The tragic events that preceded Mr. Jiru's death have caused our schools to evaluate school programs and community involvement. The <clears throat> The recent, um, can't read that word. The recent, whatever that word is, please. Update. I, just don't, I don't have it in front of an email. Though, I'm of, sorry. Of, uh, the reason, I think it's rash, whatever. The recent rash yeah. of, of spectator misconduct yes. at school um, sporting events throughout Vermont is concerning. We urge the Agency of Education and the Vermont Principals Association to give consideration to how best to respond to misbehavior by spectators and to act decisively to limit the harm that can be caused to students and to other attendees. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next item on the agenda, I think it, <coughs> it would be appropriate to do introductions and um, I'll start with mine me and then I'd like you to go around the room and then we'll go to the remote. So my name is Nilda Ganella French and I am the chair of the Maple Run Supervisory Union Board. Next, 
uh, Nina Hunsaker, co-chair, um, Maple Run Unified School. <coughs> Do you want to start with Leah, maybe, and then we'll work our way around? Yeah, that's fine. What yeah. can you do with the chat? All right. I think she... Oh, okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Right. Right. Um, my name is Leah Fitzgerald. I'm a junior at BFA and I'm a student representative. My name is Sarah McConnell. I'm also a junior at BFA and I'm also a student representative. My name is Joanna Jarose and I am a school board member for Maple Run. I am Bill Kimball and I'm the superintendent of schools for Maple Run. I'm Jack McCarthy, school board member from the, I'm representing the town of St. Albans. <clears throat> Cassavant Magnin, and I'm school board member from uh, Fairfield. Uh, Peter Delore, St. Albans City, and I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Jeff Benet, I'm director of Indian Education for Franklin County Public Schools. Okay, anyone else in the room, please? Okay. Do you want to do the rest of the staff first or the visitors? No, the staff is fine. Okay. Stacy Ruhl, St. Albans City School. In the air. Casey Provost, HR Director for Maple Run. All right, and then we can go to visitors. I think this is the next. Hi, I'm here too. <laughs> All right, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie, uh, St. Albans Town Rep. <clears throat> Grant. Grant Henderson, uh, Maple Run uh, Board Directors for uh, St. Louis Town. And then, Nelda, do you want, where else would you like to do? Would you like to do all the visitors or are you good? Do you have visitors in the room? Yes, we do. Okay, um, sure. Uh, sure. Where are the visitors? They're over on the side here. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Suzanne Kenyon, and I'm from St. <clears throat> Albans City, and I'm running for a seat on the board. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'm Jennifer Huskett. This is my husband, Ken Huskett. We're parents at City School and yeah. BFA. Thank you. Uh, Mike Campbell, uh, BFA teacher. I'm Sarah Katam. I'm the assistant principal at BFA. Thank you. Um, Julia Coble, BFA Junior. And then I think we should go to, can we go to Stephanie just for a minute here? Stephanie Gagnon. Hey, I'm Stephanie Gagnon. Uh, earlier, John Muldoon, assistant superintendent. Say it again, John. I don't. Sorry, John Muldoon, assistant superintendent. Thank you. I think you have the room. Okay. Anybody remotely? <clears throat> that? I'm Angela Stebbins, the principal at Saint Albans Town Educational Center. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelsey Malbuff, the principal at Fairfield Center School. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Joan Cabell. The city. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think two, pe two people were trying to talk at the same time. <laughs> Kim Van, director of the Collins Early. Stephanie Ripley, early childhood director. Okay, do I have everyone? No, but I think you got the ones who wanted to introduce themselves. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you all for taking the time to do that. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda <clears throat> is a visitor section. So um, the public comment visitor section of the meeting is an opportunity for community members to address issues of concern about policy, budget, or administrative matters or to share ideas about how we can work together 
to improve our schools. We value input and respect divergent views. We ask you to limit your <clears throat> remarks to two minutes per topic and refrain from airing grievances with individual members of the school community, including respecting the privacy of the students and the parents. If there is anyone in the um, <clears throat> public that wishes to speak, um, they can raise their hand and get, get um, acknowledged and then go. <clears throat> Is there a mic for them to speak at? Or are they speaking in play uh, for anyway for two minutes? I'm going to time you <clears throat> for the two minutes and I'm going to give you a warning a few seconds before the two minutes is over. And I'm going to have you wrap that means wrap it up, okay? Because I'm going to I'm going to cut you off, basically. <laughs> um, and then um, those of you that are remote and wish to speak, please put your name in the comments section. And um, I think John Mildoon will monitor that and let us know if anyone remotely wishes to speak. So let's um, get anyone in the room that wishes to speak first, please. <clears throat> I don't think Am I any. hearing none? No, I don't think we have anybody. Nilda? We don't have anybody? Okay. <clears throat> Is there anyone um, remotely that wishes to address the board? Uh, nobody has a yet, Nilda. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. We have two things, the approval of minutes and the media packet. Um, I just wanted to point out, I have to pull something out, January 26th, I think it states that I was present, and I believe I was present remotely, which just needs to be adjusted. Otherwise, does anyone want to pull any of those minutes out for discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, <clears throat> consent agenda is approved. <clears throat> and I'm going to turn it over to Nina for the next section. Okay, uh, reports to the board. Um, we'll turn it over to Leah and Sarah. Perfect. Um, okay, so we at the high school, we have entered the second semester. Um, as some of you may know, as we were talking about last time, report cards are out. Um, we would like to give kind of like a shout out to students and staff on making it halfway. <laughs> and we know that it's, um, it's hard for some students at this like time, we know it's cold getting darker like and it is that halfway point which is hard for some students but um, yeah the kids have started new semesters um, some exciting news is we want to give a thanks to the Reddix Foundation that gave us the grant as we have been moving on um, the student voice committee has been moving into our like final steps of what we wanted to do with the grant which we shared with you guys a little bit um, a couple months ago, I want to say. So we've kind of finalized our plan. Um, huge thank you to Sue Conley and Dennis Ward who got that kind of in place and Sue especially and the Reddix Foundation that gave us the grant. Um, so what we have decided as um, the voice committee among giving out like surveys to students and talking about, you know, what what is best or what could be used with the money that we got, we have decided to um, implement some new enrichment programs within BFA. Um, with our schedule on Wednesdays, we have a 90-minute period that is a long time, and some teachers and students have seen that that's a very long time for students to have that open time, and some of it, we're thinking, can be used more um, productively, which is where we want to have more enrichment ideas open for students to be able to sign up and um, more some creative ideas and that keeps it very open for us um, to have the kind of activities set up during those 90 minutes and Sarah can speak to some of the things we're going to be offering. Yeah. Um, so we sent out a survey to um, all the students at the school um, asking like what their interests would be in so we did like cooking or art or we wanted to get kids up and moving so we did um, activities at the complex. Um, we're doing room ball and the weight room and all sorts of other different things. Um, and so right now we're in the process of getting that set up with teachers um, and getting like sign-up sheets, or not sign-up sheets, but a sign-up program and um, getting that up and running. Mm -hmm. 
So we're very excited to be offering that and creating some more community aspects as well. But yeah, that's our report kind of in the making. We're very happy to have it be solidified. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> Any students or comments? Great. Thank you very much. You. And the days are getting shorter. The lights. No, just no, wanted. No, <laughs> did I say longer. it the other way? They're getting longer. Oh, the yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's, did I say it the other way? You said it the other way. That's okay. I actually saw the sunset when yeah. driving. Yeah. I know. Like, yeah. Yes. yes. No, the days are short. short. No. Days are short. No, no thank you. We're yeah. <laughs> just pick it up. Okay. Um, let's see. This is Jeff Benet, um, this is Goy Valley's uh, director of the Indian Education, is going to be speaking, take 15 to 20 minutes. Um, um, Mr. Benet, I'm going to turn it over to you. There's some people looking at me, 15 to 20 minutes is how long it takes for me to introduce myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's, that's 15 to 20 here. minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Why? Um, well. <laughs> First off, I, I wanted to to, uh, to mention, you know, I'm director of Indian Education for Franklin County Public Schools. Primarily, uh, we've worked in Missisquai Valley School District, the old Franklin Northwest Supervisory Union, Swanton and Highgate, the traditional homeland to the Missisquai Abenaki. One of the things that's really important for folks to understand is that um, the uh, commitment to diversity is not part of some woke uh, agenda. It's not part of something that uh, we're just looking at today or the last five years or 10 years, the idea of diversity and the celebration of diversity was first coined by a professor at um, Princeton, Harsh Kalin, in, in 1917. This was in response to the melting pot notion of sameness. What was going on um, in the United States, we had the first wave of immigration in the 1880s. The second wave was in the 1915 to 1920. And what folks were finding, especially in public schools, um, public schools as founded by Horace Mann, uh, were that kids were coming in and everyone was coming in different levels. So what people wanted to do was to look at kids and say, don't come into school with your language, don't come in with your clothes, we're looking for sameness. And that was the um, melting pot notion, that was the Anglo-Saxon commitment. What people like Horace Kalin and others were saying, they said, wait a minute, folks are coming in and we've got all kinds of diversity, and isn't there something good in the diversity? And he you know, coined this phrase, cultural pluralism. And today, whether we talk about it as diversity, um, we talk about the commitment to and the celebration of, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that is, this is something um, that isn't just in the last 10, 15, 20 years. We have had an Indian education program for 42 years um, in uh, the Swan Highgate area. So it's not something that uh, just came on the scene. The Indian education uh, program is something that uh, was formulated. It was uh, Bobby Kennedy's last act before um, he was assassinated. He went into Indian country, and um, he found that the conditions were deplorable. So after he was uh, assassinated, um, what happened was the legislature, uh, legislature um, came up with this idea of the Indian Education Act of 1972, which called for parent involvement, parent determination, self-determination. Um, it was really important to think that parents were finally going to have a say in their children's education. So that was in 1972, the Indian Education Act of 1972. What's interesting is that oftentimes uh, people say to me, well, you're director of Indian education. Um, that's kind of anachronistic. Like, why aren't you uh, director of NATO? Um, affairs or Native American uh, education. And it's an interesting story to, to, to hear what it is about Native folks um, and what's important to them. And one of the reasons why I think for me um, it, uh, it has allowed me to work in Native communities for uh, going on five decades. Um, there's something called the National Advisory Council on Indian Education, NACI. <laughs> NACI oversees all education uh, programs for Native peoples, whether you're federally recognized, state recognized, um, NACI is the go-to uh, player in Washington. So I had an opportunity to do some consulting to NACI. The feds came to them and said, look, um, this has been called NACI, National Advisory Council on Indian Education. What we'd like to do is think about changing it. And we're going to ask you, do you want to have it now? Uh, maybe you want to have it that uh, it's the Advisory Council. Um, Native American Affairs, again, Indian Education, let's replace it. What the Native peoples came and did, they said, okay, 
So what's it going to cost us if we go ahead and do this? What's it going to cost in terms of stationary? What's it going to cost in terms of just letterhead? You know, the amount of money, um, and they weren't even thinking about the amount of trees that uh, would be wasted, but they wanted to know, you know, nuts and bolts. The feds came back and said it's going to cost approximately $250,000 for us to make the changes. So if we're going to make the changes to indigenous peoples, or we're going to make it to First Nations, whatever you want it to be, that's what it's going to cost. The Native peoples turned to the feds and said, you know what, we'll leave it as NACI. We'll leave it National Advisory Council on Indian Education and better take the $250,000 and use it for direct services for children. That's what we'd like to see. And that's what they did, and that's what it's been ever since. So I have been Director of Indian Education for over 40 years. Um, and although it's often said, you know, uh, isn't that something that uh, should change and don't you want it to change? And it's like, if it's good enough for Native folks uh, nationwide, it's good enough for me. But I think it allows you to get an idea of what the Abenaki of um, this area, Missisquoi, there are four state-recognized tribes. Um, this is the oldest and the largest, is Missisquoi. Um, and that's the one that I think most of you um, know something about. Um, Bill had asked me when um, we were first talking about this that, uh, you know, would, would I uh, talk, uh, he said, maybe there are going to be some questions. Um, and I said, sure, whatever questions folks might have, um, I'll answer them. But better yet, maybe at the end, if people have additional questions, we can get to that. Um, one of the things that always comes up is the idea of why aren't more Abenakis um, self-identifying? You know, why is it that we can say that at the city elementary school, for instance, there are only a handful of kids that are uh, native that are uh, self-identified as Abenaki? When the reality is they're not just a couple, they're dozens and dozens, and in fact, uh, here at the Maple Run School District, we're talking about hundreds of students. So why would that be? And, and it gets back to uh, some stuff that I think for a lot of people they don't necessarily know. So if I said to you, on March 31st, 1931, the state of Vermont was the 29th state in the country to pass sterilization laws, is that a true or false statement? And what would people think? The 29th state in the country March 31, 31st, 1931, <clears throat> sterilization laws. Is that true or is that false? Well, it's true. true. And what's unfortunate um, is that most people in here don't know that. Um, and the reality is um, uh, most Abenaki never talked about it. In 1995, I was contacted by a guy named Greg Sanford, uh, who is the state archivist. And he said, Jeff, we've got boxes and boxes in Montpelier. We don't know what they're about, but we can see that they're to do with Franklin County. And Franklin County, and we look at the surnames, and they're clearly Abenaki names. So can you take a look at these and tell us if you want to do something with them? So I went down to Montpelier. I had no idea what they were. I brought it back up to Swanton, uh, and I shared it with the chief at the time. His name was Homer St. Francis. And he turned ashen, and, and to know Homer, as Peter remembers. Um, he was someone who was very verbal. Um, he shut right down and uh, he said, we're not ready to deal with this. And I said, well, deal with what? And he said, we're not ready to deal with this. And he said, but don't throw these things away. Make sure they're put aside, but I'll tell you when it's okay. Shortly afterwards, I got a call from a guy named Michael Oatman, a professor of art at UVM. It seems that the University of Vermont wanted to start coming to terms with its role in what was called the eugenics survey of Vermont. Um, because the professor of zoology, Henry Perkins, uh, was the founder. Uh, and UVM was starting to come to terms with what was its role. So what he wanted to do, this uh, Michael Oakman, was to do an exhibit um, at the Fleming Museum. He was going to entitle it the Long Shadow Exhibit. Um, and he said he'd be honored if the Abenaki came and previewed this. So um, at the time I was chair of the Governor's Advisory Commission on Native American Affairs, we decided to have a commission meeting and bring along the tribal council, the Abenaki Tribal Council from Swanton, uh, down to this, uh, this, this event. Um, we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, we started viewing this, uh, and what Oatman had done was give his rendition of what Henry Perkins' study looked like. So you walked in and there was a roll-top desk. Behind the roll-top desk was a blackboard. 
and on the blackboard with different categories, uh, categories of people, uh, categories like uh, gypsies, um, mixed bloods, Indians, French Canadian, uh, and then the categories went into imbeciles, uh, feeble-minded, and it went on and on. Well, what was that all about? Um, in 1905, Alfred Binet, no relation to me, but Alfred Binet, <laughs> B-E-N-E-T, uh, invented the IQ, the Binet IQ test. The one thing he asked when he was coming over from France to the United States was please don't use it for sorting. Don't use it for categorizing. Please don't do it. The first thing we did was to use it in the military as a way to sort the, the soldiers, the officers from the Bronx. So what happened a short time afterwards was that we had people like Henry Perkins who took the IQ test and these were going to be used against people, against Vermonters. Um, so this is what becomes so difficult for people to really you know, grasp. What we then saw behind the blackboard, we're looking at the blackboard, but then you walk around and um, you come to a table that looks like a gynecological table. In fact, it was, and it was taken from the week school uh, down, uh, <laughs> Uh, people know Brandon Training School uh, down in Brandon, Vermont. This is where uh, people were getting sterilized. So they actually had gotten the table, had it there. It was becoming very, very difficult for people. The Abenaki started to weep, and uh, understandably. And I really had messed this up because we had media there. You know, so whether it's CAX and PTZ, and, I mean, we had a lot of media, and, and I had no idea what people were going to be, you know, sort of saying. Um, and they were really good about it, but the bottom line is, there they were, um, the print media as well as uh, a TV. In any case, the last thing you saw as you were walking around, under glass were letters, three letters uh, written, uh, and you got a chance to see these letters. The first one was written by Dorothy Canfield Fisher. People know who Dorothy Canfield Fisher is, the Poet Laureate of Vermont. Uh, the Poet Laureate of Vermont. Well, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, was a strong proponent of youth, um, eugenics. Uh, she was a strong proponent of sterilization. Dorothy Canfield Fisher felt um, that we had to do kind of like two things, two strategies in the state of Vermont. One, what do we do with those people that are here um, that we really don't want to be here, and what do we do to keep the others from entering Vermont? This is the poet laureate of Vermont, who in this letter is talking to Perkins and praising him for the work that he's doing around sterilization. The next letter is written by Margaret Sanger. Anyone know who Margaret Sanger is? Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Um, so Margaret Sanger was another person who was very, very supportive. These were considered to be progressive Vermonters who were very supportive of eugenics because the idea was, what are we going to do with these people, these feeble-minded folks and others? Uh, why should we be supporting them? I mean, you can just... Let your imagination go. But this is in Vermont. The last letter was written in German, okay? And this is written, and uh, again, none of us spoke German, but it was easy to see at the end of the letter. Who do you think the letter from Germany? Uh, someone praising uh, the virtues of Henry Perkins. Who would that be from? <clears throat> the letter was from Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler had not yet come to power, obviously, but was talking about how he and Perkins uh, should get together in the near future, because this was certainly a mutual admiration society. So here we were, and this is what we saw, and this is what people realized the next day in the papers um, and on TV. I started getting inundated with calls. I'll never forget one person, and she would be fine with me saying this. Linda Keating, Linda, her name is Linda Perrow. She grew up in St. Albans. And Linda said, Jeff, I grew up here. I went to school. Here, I went to the City Elementary School, I went to UVM, got my master's at UVM. I never heard of this. I've never heard of anything like this. I can't believe this is what was going on in Vermont. My wife, Julie Benet, her mother was a, a professor of early childhood education at UVM. Um, Julie um, said she had no idea. The point is nobody knew much about this because for whatever reason uh, in Vermont we decided not to share it. It's interesting that, uh, let me just say as an aside, in uh, Germany today, third graders are taught about the Holocaust because the feeling on the part of the German government is that unless they teach young people about what happened, the horrors of the Holocaust, that we're doomed to repeat it. It's the old Santiago line. Those who, you know, who forget history are doomed 
to repeat it. You know, so here we are in the state of Vermont, and that we're the 29th state to have sterilization laws. People don't have a clue about it. But why I'm bringing this up in particular is because, bring it back to the question that was asked of me, the idea that why do so few Abenaki self-identify? Well, what becomes the reason for that? In Franklin County, uh, the boxes that, uh, you know, uh, Greg Sanford was talking about, were the boxes and boxes of people uh, whose last name against St. Francis, you know, other folks. These were the people being targeted in Franklin County. So for people not to self-identify, I think you would understand uh, it had to do with self-preservation. Um, I think that, uh, you know, folks don't know this, so they jump to all kinds of conclusions. But the bottom line is, this is what has existed in this country, and unfortunately, we don't know very much about it. Now, one of the things that uh, you know we think is so important is the idea that people do understand. Because if you're not going to understand the trauma visited upon generations ago, those generations, and understand what that trauma was all about, it's going to be hard dealing with a generation now uh, who may present very differently, but still are presenting. And maybe at times we're not sure why they're presenting quite the way they are. But they're presenting because uh, these are you know victims of generations and generations. Uh, you know. One of the reasons Homer St. Francis didn't want me to know when he said, we're not ready to deal with it. The last person in the Abenaki community who was sterilized uh, was sterilized in 1957. Um, this guy was alive in Swanton, and Homer didn't want him to be around in case the reporters would start contacting him, wanting to go and meet the last person sterilized you know, in, uh, in Swanton. So Homer waited for the guy to pass. Once the guy had died, he said, we're ready to deal with this. And then that's when we you know, started dealing with it. Started dealing with it in terms of the University of Vermont. Started dealing with it in the state of Vermont two years ago. Uh, the legislature, uh, Representative Tom Stevens of Waterbury, uh, incredibly beautiful uh, apology. But all these apologies. But the bottom line is, you can apologize all you want uh, unless we look at education uh, and really look to education um, we're doomed, you know, and unfortunately, we look at something like this, the sterilization, and to understand what we're talking about, people were given choices, because in Vermont it was called voluntary sterilization. They were given choices. Either you go to jail or you be sterilized, so that was the choice. So go to jail and be sterilized. People didn't even know what sterilization meant, you know, but uh, this is what happened. Up our way, um, it was, you know, uh, prevalent. And, and, and I think that uh, when we started looking at educational programs, it was always keeping in mind what had gone on and the horrors visited upon people. So through the years, we've had the opportunity to work closely with people here in Maple Run. When it's Franklin Central Supervisory Union, um, there were lots of collaboratives that we were always looking to, especially school systems, uh, NCSS, uh, DCF. There were things we were always trying to do. Within the Abenaki community, there's always been a sense if it's good for the Abenaki kids, invariably it's going to be good for other kids. So one of the first initiatives we had was what we call Missisquoi Mentoring. And the Abenaki have long felt mentoring is a really good idea. Um, and it was a good idea. And they said, okay, it's been really good for the Abenaki community. Let's bring it to all of the county. So Jeff, where would it be wise to bring it? And I thought of a place, uh, and I was a little biased because I was president of the board, it was the Franklin County Caring Community which is still um, around today, and it became Watershed Mentoring. But Watershed Mentoring got its start uh, through the Abenaki community. There are dozens of initiatives that got started. Again, the feeling was, if it's good for the Abenaki, it's going to be good uh, for everyone. So when we look at some of the things that we have going on that um, we're really uh, anxious to be able to share uh, with kids here, for instance, it's going to college. I was just saying to Peter, the Abenaki have long believed College isn't for everyone, but if it's something that children and their families choose to make, you know, that decision, this is what they want, they should be allowed to make that decision. And in a democratic society, we feel that should be. It's not for everyone, and for a lot of Abenaki kids, it's not the answer. But when we looked at these assessments that found in 1985 that fewer than 5% of Abenakis were going on to any kind of post-secondary, fewer than 5%. Keep in mind, at that time, 70% of Abenaki heads of household, 70% dropped out of school before ninth grade. 
it's, it's astounding when we start to look at some of these statistics. But they held tight to the idea of education as a great equalizer. They really felt that education is the way to transcend the socioeconomic conditions that Abenaki found themselves in. So it became very, very important uh, to work with the schools, um, and that's what we really look to do. Uh, working with the schools, because the Abenaki are what are called an off-reservation rural group. Um, so the kids attend area public schools. There are no Abenaki schools. Um, they've always attended the public schools. And I think that through the years, uh, we've worked closely uh, with the schools up here. I think of the city elementary school in particular. And um, you know, you go upstairs to where Joan's office is and, and to the uh, side of it, there's a mural. I, I, the people know the mural. The, um, well, that's an Abenaki uh, mural. It was de dedicated to the Abenaki. It was something that was done by an art teacher back uh, several years ago um, at City, Al Salzman. Al Salzman did this with a, a social studies teacher <coughs> great, uh, named Don Jarrett. So this was a multidisciplinary uh, unit uh, that the two of them worked on and they brought us into it so that we could be uh, providing uh, a lot of the technical assistance. So what we wound up with was this incredible uh, mural, you know, that uh, people took a lot of pride in. The tribal council uh, came and um, were asked to, uh, to be there when it was actually unveiled. Uh, Al Sausman was very, very proud of it, as were other folks at City Elementary. I'll never forget uh, the chief, Homer St. Francis, turning to me, and he was crying, and he said, do you think we'll see something like this at MVU in my lifetime? And I said, I don't really think so, but maybe. Well, we didn't. I mean, he, he passed, but a couple years after, uh, and you did something very, very similar. But the first place that this was done was here in St. Albans. You know, it was at the city elementary school. And it was the city elementary school, through the, the, the teachers, working with the Abenaki, you know, in, in trying to eradicate the poverty that so many Abenaki uh, families found themselves in. So what I'd like to just leave you with is this idea. For a long time, we've worked with um, your district. But it's always been on the periphery. You know, it's, it's not been that we are actually uh, under this umbrella together, the Title VI Indian Education uh, programs. And we felt that at a time like this, um, it behooves us to really start working together. We're talking about the ubiquitous term equity. Uh, equity is on everyone's lips. Well, if we're going to be serious about a conversation about equity and what equity means, then it behooves us to start working with people like the Abenaki. Because when we look at the ESSER monies and we look at monies that were made available uh, you know, through the federal government, one of the areas that uh, folks are supposed to work with are in areas that have to do with the historically underserved population. Well, the historically underserved communities in the state of Vermont, um, that's the Abenaki. So when this st money started becoming available, I was inundated. Uh, with school districts uh, asking for our input into their plans. And one of the things we said was that, you know, in a place like here and other districts as well, rather than, you know, something that was just lip service, wouldn't it make a lot more sense for us to be able to actually sit down and start working in earnest together? Um, that would make a lot more sense if we're talking about a genuine commitment to equity of educational opportunity. Um, and that's why Bill and I started talking. And I was really pleased with where our conversations were going. We're looking at um, the uh, Albert and the islands. Uh, we've got a commitment from the school board, uh, the superintendent up there. What we're trying to look at is the reality that in Franklin and Grand Isle counties, uh, every district other than Fairfax, uh, Georgia, and Fletcher, the Franklin West, uh, every other school uh, has a lot of Abenaki kids. In the Franklin Northeast, up in Richford, Bakersfield, that area, there are hundreds of Abenaki kids. I mean, hundreds and hundreds. Um, but here, too, uh, there are a lot of kids. And if we can start working with schools down here and working together, these are programs that we can offer to your kids, to our kids, um, at no cost to schools. Um, one of the things that the Abenaki always taken pride about is that uh, in 42 years, uh, never asked a dime of the school system. It's been very, very important that they never had to do that because there was always the chance that people would say uh, no. Um, so when you had something and you were offering something and it was for free, uh, it was much easier to get uh, a consensus about providing services. 
I'm going to leave you with uh, a bunch of materials that we've developed from scholarship guides. Um, so when we look at Abenaki kids going on to college, we can develop programs with places like the University of Vermont, the, uh, the newly formed Vermont State College system that will be starting July 1. Um, and if we're looking at first generation kids going to school, which certainly first generation, you've got lots of kids, right? So it's not just Abenaki, it's these other kids. Well, this scholarship guide, there are hundreds of scholarships that allow us to tap into these programs. We have done something in the Abenaki community called the Summer Happening, the UVM Abenaki Summer Happening. It's in its 37th year, because what we found was that we needed to start providing something. Parents didn't know that there was this thing called financial aid. So I would have parents say to me that, I mean, my kid wants to be a teacher. We've explained to her, you can't be a teacher. We can't send you to college. Because they didn't know there was this thing called financial aid. The other thing was the idea of going to Burlington from Swanton. A trip to the big city was a trip from Swanton to St. Albans. <laughs> that is, I mean that when I say that was the trip to the big city. A trip to Burlington was a trip to Dorset Street and then getting off the University Mall. You know, and that was once, maybe every six months, eight months. So how do you start the socialization process of even thinking about kids going to school? Well, we started it with kids going to seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, um, and having them go during the summer, spending time down at the campuses uh, in Burlington, at UVM, at St. Mike's, at Champlain, um, and parents also partaking of this experience so that the socialization was happening and the opportunities when kids started going to classes and seeing what classes were like. Slowly but surely, um, we started developing these opportunities. So now we're looking at upwards of 38% of the kids in the Abenaki community go on to college. Again, that's great for those kids who want to go on. Our commitment is to all kids. So it's going to look at what is it for the other kids <coughs> as well. And toward that end, you know, we work on a lot of things that are more hands-on. Uh, and there are lots of initiatives that we've developed collaboratively. And that's what we'd like to be able to do with you folks. So I know I took a lot longer. I have materials here for you to take. If um, anything, of, uh, you know, you find anything of interest, let Bill know if you need a different copies. Yeah. I can get you whatever you need. But I think you'll find this, um, you'll find this interesting. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry that we started with a downer, you know, the idea of eugenics. But the reality is, when you ask me, yeah. you know, why, or someone asked, you know, the question about why do so many people, why don't they self-identify? You begin to understand, you know, why people didn't. You begin to understand that Abenaki were able to go underground. So for some, they went into the woods and practiced who they were as Abenaki in traditional ways. Others were able to say, hey, I'm going to go around in white men's society. That's fine. What most Abenaki did was a process called acculturation. They worked and walked in both worlds. Uh, and that's what most people do to this day. Uh, and they're able to do that. Um, a lot of what we do is for the children. We believe in the seventh generations, the next seven generations, we talk to what are the supports for the kids, what are the supports for elders. Uh, and that's what it's really all about. And toward that end, a lot of people know our Circle of Courage after school program, which we offer for uh, you know all kids. Uh, again, as an after school initiative, uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they learn native crafts, they learn native uh, drumming, uh, as many kids are non Abenaki, as Abenaki like to take advantage of this because it's cool. It's cool to learn drumming. It's cool to learn some of this stuff. And kids love it. Um, so those become the kind of things that uh, we'd like to be able to offer, you know, here as well. I can remember several years, several years ago, Joan Gavalli contacted me and said, I've got a kid. We really need to get her into Circle of Courage. And, um, Joan and I worked on that together to figure out how we're going to provide transportation, but we did. Because for that particular youngster, that which we focused on in Circle of Courage, the tenets of belonging, independence, generosity, and mastery, Joan felt that for this particular student, she would really benefit from learning that. And um, I'd say to you that for a lot of our kids, uh, this is exactly what they can benefit from. So if there are any questions, um, you know, I've just given you a, a, a thumb sketch, you know, uh, Indian education programs, but uh, again, the opportunity of working. We have a, what's called a parent advisory committee that oversees Indian education. Uh, the reason why Indian education works is not because of Jeff Benet, it's because we have this pack, and the pack is made of parents, student, teachers, 
Um, we have school board members. Um, we have all kinds of folks. They are the people who decide, like, what do we want to, what do we want to do in education and in culture, you know? And that path um, we would extend, obviously, to this area. So what that's do you it, need, Bill. Jeff, what do you need from the board or from me to <laughs> move forward together in collaboration? Actually, um, not much. Um, I need a check for fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you told me it was free. <laughs> uh, Bill, uh, literally nothing. I, yeah. I uh, uh, put on the uh, the application uh, that we've extended our programming from Mississauga Valley to Mississauga Valley Maple Run and the islands, and yeah. uh, and that's it. Once a year, we need to disaggregate Abenaki data. Uh, Which and we other do. Than that, yeah. that's, that's it. Yep. Uh, literally, that's it. No, thank you. I mean, I, I, it's very interesting. I mean, if you yeah. have talks, I, I would love to, you know, put that out there because it's, I, I thank you very much. And yeah. I think well, there's, right. it sounds like there's a, quite a bit more that we can all learn from, too. Um, any questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Benet. Well, thanks. Any questions? Jeff, are there any um, electives that happen at MVU or any of the other schools just in, in, yeah. um, Indian education, Indian history. Yeah, well, so we started something called field studies um, program yep. up there. And field like studies were something um, Mike Kane, late Mike Kane and mm -hmm. I worked on together. And uh, it was a hands-on initiative that's now one of the most popular electives at MVU. There are a lot of opportunities we can talk about, but field studies uh, is the most recent because what we would be able to do with that, I was able to hire Mike to be the mentor to the two teachers. One is a special educator, the other is a science teacher. Uh, and Mike uh, was an incredible yeah. mentor you know, to them. So the monies to pay for Mike came through Indian education. Mm -hmm. And that's how we were able to you know, leverage. And, and, uh, and we were able to pay for staff development opportunities uh, and all kinds of stuff that came out of that. What we have looked at in the past are things like languages, um, where we can actually start talking about teaching conversational Abenaki. We do offer Native American studies um, at MVU. Okay. The first Native American studies <coughs> course, you should know, was something that I worked on uh, uh, vociferously with a guy named Larry Trombley. Larry Trombley was a social studies teacher at MVU. And uh, Larry, unfortunately, uh, from our perspective, um, Larry left MVU and became a teacher at BFA. Uh, and he took with him uh, all the materials, which I said, you know, was fine because we had Abenaki kids at BFA, um, and then we developed, um, you know, the Native American Studies uh, course as well. But the course that Larry was offering down here was phenomenal, you know. But that's again how you're able to collaborate. So things like the Native American Studies, the field studies, there are lots of initiatives that we look to work on with um, the uh, the different schools. The the big thing that we're looking at now. Uh, we were able to get um, uh, foundational monies through Seventh Generation Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's a foundation. And uh, we're developing an Abenaki curriculum. There's never been an Abenaki curriculum in, for public school use. Uh, we've always talked about it. Uh, the Agency of Education has talked about it. Um, but now what we're actually doing is developing that. Excellent. And uh, hopefully the, by the end of the year, uh, that will be made available to every school uh, in the state of Vermont. Uh, and then there'll be all kinds of professional development opportunities that would be made available, let's say, to teachers here, and they'll be made available free of charge. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Another question. Please. For, with the programs, are these mainly in the high schools or elementary as well? Well, I ask a good question, um, all, all uh, levels. I'm most, people often think of that, that I'm oftentimes, it, it's the high school, but mm -hmm. because even down here, I'm at BFA a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I'm at, I'm at the elementary schools as much as I'm in the uh, high school. And the programs are really for all kids. But, yeah. Good question. Anybody else? Anybody online? Yeah. Yes. Nilda, Grant, Katie? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Benet. Really okay, appreciate thank you. it. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> right. Thanks, thank Jeff. You, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. Nils, do I have old business or you? Sorry. I have old business. So okay. we'll start in right. on uh, old business while you guys are. Yep, yep. Sorry, Sorry, I just forgot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you, John. Old business, 7A, implicit bias and anti-racism training. Um, 
I believe that Bill has an update for us. Yes, well, what I was going to say, Nilda, um, that we talked about, um, and I know that Peter's going to jump online. He's going to go back to his house and do that, so he's transitioning right now. Um, yeah. On the wall behind me, and I don't know if the camera can get it, is a timeline. It's just I wanted to give an example of work that the leadership team's been doing with our consulting um, group, creative discourse group. Uh, this happened yesterday in here with our leadership team, and we were really taking a look at a history of what is in our, what's in our current history and what we don't know about history uh, related really to racial instances, most of them, but not all of them, of uh, African Americans. Um, and so we did an activity that I left on the wall at the end from the equity justice I forget what the I is, but I should remember. In, initiative. initiative. In, in, what was it? Initiative. Initiative. That's what I thought. That's what I guessed. Uh, website where you can go on. There's a site there where you can pick your birthday or birth month, and then we found an activity and what found something that happened in history, and we um, talked about that. And you, we wrote them up here on the timeline, and how did that affect uh, ourselves along with what we know about history and what we didn't know. But if you see the check marks that are up there, you'll see we all checked what we didn't know. And there's quite a few check marks up there. Uh, I just thought it was good evidence of the work the leadership team's doing right now. We have been in constant work, as I've reported to you before. Of, this has been part of our literacy, our equity literacy for ourselves. Um, and just thought it would be something better to present. And I'd also mention that the first meeting of the design committee for the with creative discourse group to our use the results of the listening sessions and are designing a time to come together this spring with the community to talk about next steps from what we learned in those listening sessions so we're meeting monthly on that and we're hoping for an april at latest may community meeting so and it's made up of students parents community members and a couple staff members thank you any questions Okay, uh, moving on to 7B, setting goals. I think Grant is prepared to give us an update on that. And I think there's some materials in our past related to it. Yeah, thanks, Nilda. Um, so the Board <laughs> Committee for Setting Goals uh, tonight has some recommendations for the board um, that I'll present uh, a little bit of background um, on what that subcommittee um, has been working on over the last few months. Um, we started off by First, you know, considering how do we actually want to, um, you know, establish goals? You know, is it something that we felt that as a subcommittee, you know, we knew enough on our own that we could, you know, just try to throw together some goals and, and, and propose those? Um, you know, uh, we talked about that briefly and very quickly decided that we wanted, you know, a high level of community engagement um, to make it a more sort of comprehensive and uh, collaborative uh, process with, uh, you know, a strong uh, voice from the community. Um, and so uh, for a few sessions, we we talked about the best way to do that. Uh, just happened to coincide with the listening sessions that um, Bill uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, so with the creative discourse group, um, we added um, a few uh, discussion points um, that that helped us uh, sort of further the goal setting um, agenda as well. Uh, and those made it into the topics for conversation. Um, and so, um, I don't know, a month or two ago, uh, we got sort of some consolidated results uh, from those listening sessions. Um, and the uh, feedback um, could be grouped into, into five main categories, uh, two of which um, really focused on, um, you know, an underst better understanding, um, responsiveness and policy setting around diversity and inclusion. Um, and we felt that the, our particular subcommittee, um, you know, was not particularly well suited um, to devise goals around those uh, topics. Um, and fortunately we had created discourse group already engaged by the district um, and willing to um, consider those goals uh, separately, um, or I guess in collaboration, um, we do have a few folks from the uh, goal setting committee um, that are attending those meetings as well. Um, so we'll be getting um, some goals around those topics um, at a future date, um, but we do have uh, the, the remaining topics 
um, which uh, were categorized as uh, rigorous academics, um, um, a better understanding of services and inter infrastructure. And the third one is uh, community engagement. Um, so, so we have goals to propose for those three topic areas. Um, the way that uh, we've, we've organized things is we have a recommendation to the board um, that we, we tried to keep at a policy level. Uh, we found early on that it was um, really easy to get into um, sort of execution level uh, recommendations, you know, um, you know, if, if we could only ask teachers to do X, Y, Z, or, you know, if the, if the administration could, you know, do these things, you know, but, but that's not what we wanted to recommend to the board, right? We wanted policy level goals. And so the way that we've organized this is we have three policy level goals um, with some actions to consider. Um, so these are things that are still kind of high level, trying to walk that line, um, you know, to not be micromanaging, right? Um, and, uh, you know, Bill and the uh, central office, um, you know, actually drafted this for us. Um, so we, we believe there's some alignment there as well. Um, rather than try to paraphrase, I'm, I'm just going to read if that's okay. Um, the goal uh, associated with academic rigor is to, uh, the recommendation uh, from the subcommittee for goal setting is to ensure the school district works with the Maple Run community uh, being educators, students, parents, and community members to define how each graduate of Maple Run receives relevant and rigorous learning that allows them to succeed in career and lifelong learning. We suggest that a group of community members use the portrait of a graduate process to define the goals of Maple Run. Understanding the process selection is a decision of the administration. Um, portrait of a graduate um, is a um, uh, well-established, um, I guess, uh, deliverable um, for this type of a um, for this type of a goal. Uh, if you want to Google uh, search for a portrait of a graduate examples, you'll see what it looks like. It's typically a one page, looks a little bit like an infographic um, that that um, you know that has the goal of um, uh, providing several uh, high-level categories, uh, sort of for excellence. And, um, you know, we believe that the, you know, using basically the same uh, or similar workflows uh, to the listening sessions, um, it would be best if uh, we, we use that sort of those sort of communications tool to figure out uh, from the community what, what those important factors are or attributes are of a graduate and, and convert that into a portrait, portrait of a graduate type deliverable. Um, the actions to consider. Uh, we would like uh, to consider uh, ensuring every student has the same access to learning opportunities, uh, providing different pathways to the same outcomes, engaging families about student outcomes and pathways for learning, monitoring and communicating student growth in all areas by individual students and aggregation in the way that all can understand. Um, <clears throat> these were some you know, high level actions. Uh, that sort of came to the top through brainstorming sessions uh, of the committee. Um, you know, upon reviewing feedback also from the community. Um, in addition to these, uh, the administration has all of the notes from those meetings um, and all the listening sessions. Um, and they, you know, they're obviously um, able to take all that into consideration. In addition to the the you know few bullet points that we've listed as uh, here. Um, the second area uh, that I mentioned was services to families and students. The goal associated with that is uh, that, um, let's see, how do we write this? Uh, support for Maple Run to work within the, direct, the district's means and to partner with outside agencies. This will provide students and families needing resources, uh, access uh, to their educational, needing resources to access their educational opportunities. Um, <clears throat> this could mean aligning services and infrastructure across agencies to help students and families, uh, informing parents about services and programs available for children, engaging families about how to be involved in their child's learning, and providing a resource area for families in each school. Um, the idea here being uh, that, you know, we, we look at all those services the community has to offer that could positively influence education, 
and um, you know, we we sort of allow the school to be um, not really an administrator of those, but a facilitator um, in any way that can that can help out the learning. Uh, the third area is family engagement. Um, the goal here is to enhance the ability for Maple Run leadership, uh, board and administrators to provide meaningful opportunities for families engagement in their students' education. This will require opportunities for open-ended conversations and exchanging ideas, two-way information sharing. The actions to consider, uh, engaging families about how to be involved in their child's learning, hosting curriculum-based events, providing more opportunities for parents and community members to be active in the school, such as open houses, career days, and cultural exchanges, and ensuring the board works on policies for public comment and family involvement. Um, these, uh, you know, I think um, are, you know, probably more, a little more self-explanatory than the others. Um, you know, the idea being that, um, you know, we, we engage the community um, as much as possible uh, to gain to gain that support and also to provide um, support where needed. So um, you know the board has access to this document, um, and um, I don't know, Bill. If I don't know if we need an action on this or if it can just be a recommendation at this time. We thought it should be a um, recommendation right now, Grant, because yep. the creative discourse group and the community piece. They're looking at all five of the areas from the listening feedback. We want to make sure that we're able to capture what the community gives us in the spring. Okay. So I think with that, you know, so that's the recommendation. If anything needs clarification, um, you know, we can we can have uh, questions um, for a discussion um, at this time. Well, thank thank you, Grant. That represents a lot of work, and we appreciate you taking the lead on that. Um, does anyone have questions for Grant uh, at this time? I would extend that thanks, uh, you know, especially to the committee members um, who, uh, you know, put in all their time as well. Thank you. I meant that. I, I meant to yes. include them also. I didn't yes. mean to include them if it sounded that way, but nope. thank you. Nope, just wanted um, to make sure it was clear. Gotcha. Any questions for Grant? Okay, hearing none, we're going to move on. Thank you again. Nope. Uh, next item on the agenda is negotiations update. Nina. Um, wait. Oh, sorry. Uh, I thought Nilda was doing. I thought it. Nilda was doing <laughs> the negotiations oh, well, update. Since, since Nilda wasn't present at the last meeting, um, she's very willing to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Nilda. I wasn't. Sorry, I wasn't prepared. I think I needed to nail down the ground rules. And <laughs> No, we're not. Me, Nilda. We just we've met a couple of times. Okay, so let me let me go ahead. I'll yeah. do it. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the last time we actually we um, we did get to go through the um, the rules. Um, so we're we're all set there, and we exchanged um, and what you know exchanged talking points. Um, and we went through them, we, each of us went through them, and then that's kind of where we, we left it. And the next time we'll we might do one more exchange and then maybe some more discussion. Thank you, apologies. Nope, but sorry, Nilda, sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't make, I'm sorry I couldn't make up a matter. Nope, sorry, no, sorry. Um, I caught me off guard there. So we have, but we do have dates set for subsequent negotiations. We do. And we're looking forward to those. We do. Um, Next item on the agenda. Well, I just Jack, 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 do you have a? Well, uh, briefly, okay. Uh, okay. We, Sorry, we've that. had uh, three meetings. We did the ground rules. We, the second meeting, we exchanged some proposals. The third meeting, uh, we clarified some of the proposals, and the uh, board did not uh, enter any new proposals, but the association did. Uh, present a new proposal and uh, we exchanged uh, th those ideas, got clarification and our next meeting we decided to work on uh, se several of those. Um, it's not appropriate at this time to talk about all the different proposals that's uh, we eventually will uh, you know the board will present uh, what we've tentatively agreed upon uh, are, are, you know, 
TAs, or, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we did sign off on some real basic ones, language and uh, that kind of thing on about five, I think, or so. I don't know the exact amount, but I think we did five or six uh, uh, articles that we've already agreed upon, but they're just basic things. We haven't got into the nitty gritty uh, difficult topics that I know we'll have some discussion and debate about. But uh, it's a good good uh, association committee and a good uh, board committee. Joanna uh, has some great ideas and uh, we're moving forward. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Next item is the St. Albans City School principal update. So we have two, we're, we're in the old business section, and I think we have two items in this section that may need an executive session, depending. And we have one item in new business that may need an executive session, depending, because I believe a finding could be made that in all three of those cases, it's an employment or personnel issue depending on how this discussion goes. Am I correct with that, Bill? Yes, you are, but I'd like Casey to present the process to the board and maybe he can come up to the table just so it's easier for the uh, film and Stacy to do that and to introduce Stephanie Gangon. Gangon, sorry, I'm sorry, Stephanie, yes, I'm okay. really trying. Um, <laughs> with your last name. And then uh, just to, I want, Casey to review it, and then I think if you would like to talk with a candidate, that would be done in an executive session. But I think it's good to get on the record uh, what we've done to get the process to where we're, we're here, where I'm recommending uh, Dr. Gannon for the position of principal. So, Thank Casey. You. Perfect. Can, um, before you get started, can she um, tell her name phonetically for me? G A G. G A G. N O N. No, that's how you really spell it. <laughs> um, I always tell people it's like canyon with a G in the front, so it's canyon. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> canyon with a G is good. Thank you. You're welcome. Who's the canyon? All right, thank you so much. Um, so just wanted to give a brief overview of the, uh, the process that we had. Um, really thankful for the work of the interview committee of uh, so many members of the city school staff that participated um, throughout various points of the process, um, to students who did a tremendous job participating when our finalists visited, um, families, community members who, who participated. Um, I'll just give some brief details. So uh, we began by inviting both staff. We had a staff session and a, a very similar um, session for families and community members and guardians to join as well, where we came and discussed uh, what we felt like would be essential for the next principal to be uh, successful. So we talked about the skills and knowledge that that person would need and the personal characteristics and attributes that would be required uh, to be successful in the community. So the staff and the community had similar experiences in ranking and prioritizing those. And then from there, folks expressed interest in uh, serving on the interview committee. We had a committee of 12 members that represented um, lots of different groups. So Stacy was a part of the committee as assistant principal. We had a number of professional staff, teachers. We had um, an educational support professional, a paraeducator on the committee, an admin assistant, and a couple of parents. Uh, one is here at Charlie Brooks in the, um, in the Zoom land as well. So we really appreciate the time that everyone put into that. Um, the, the charge of the committee was to take the input that the staff and community um, had provided and then generate interview questions from there and then take the list of um, candidates who had applied and review them and select candidates to interview with us. So we had 18 candidates that applied for the position. Um, which was great. The committee invited seven candidates for interviews and six of those um, accepted in interviews with us. We held interviews over two days. We invited candidates either uh, to join us remotely or in person, however made, made the most sense for that. So we did have some, some of each. 
Um, following the interviews, the committee discussed both the strengths of each of the candidates. We were very strengths-based intentionally. And then we thought about what are the uh, additional questions that we would have um, that we don't know yet about, about these folks. And we um, selected three finalists to visit us at City School to meet with students, um, to meet the entire school community. We ended up having two finalists visit us. Uh, one withdrew the, the day of that visit, the second day. Um, at City School, we had student-led tours. So some of our seventh graders did a really great job of, uh, I think Stephanie would agree, our seventh graders did a great <laughs> job of giving, um, showing City School in a 30-minute snapshot. And uh, then we had a student panel, and students uh, were grilling the finalists with some interview questions, and then provided written feedback as well. Um, also, at the same time, we had um, we had two candidates that were working on opposite schedules. So, the central office administrators, as well as Bill, were interviewing candidates. And then after school, uh, we had a really great turnout from the staff. We had over 50 um, staff members that came to um, learn more about each of the candidates. We had each in a separate classroom. They shared about themselves, why they wanted to come to city school. And then it was more of an open forum just for staff to ask questions to, to better get to know the candidates and then um, provide written feedback there as well. And we that evening we had commu a community forum. Um, we didn't have a ton of turnout for that forum, but we're th really thankful for those who did join us. Um, when a basketball en game ended, we had a few more join us, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to find a, a time that works for everyone. So. Um, and what else? Then we had, um, we had a lot of feedback at the end of it, so we're really thankful that Folks gave information and their thoughts ahead of time, and then when we had our finalists visit us, um, gave tons of feedback, which was really important as we were all reviewing that. Um, uh, between Bill, John, Stacy, myself, we reviewed all of that, the valuable feedback that was given by students, parents and guardians, staff members, the central office team, um, and reference checks, of course, were very thorough with both finalists that we had. And I think those are some of the highlights. Yeah, I would just interject that uh, I know for both finalists, I did probably three or four reference checks in addition to what was listed, uh, asking them that day for other people um, because they were both coming from out of state. And we wanted to make sure we did a thorough job on that. Um, so we can let you know more in executive session, uh, but I think that's probably appropriate for right now. Um, just because I, I think it's the way to ethically go through it. Okay, so are we ready to go to executive session? We're set up so we can go. Okay, we, so I think for the record, we just want to deem a finding that um, this is a personal matter, so therefore we are allowed to go to, into executive session for Vermont uh, open meeting law. So may I please have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Thank you, who was that? Nina. Nina, thank you. Is there a second? Joanna. Thank you. We have a, a motion and a second to go into executive session. Uh, any questions? Okay, because we're doing a hybrid meeting of on-site and remote, we have to do a roll vote. So Grant? Yes. Jack? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Katie? Yes. <clears throat> Nina? Yes. Peter? Yes. Susan? Yes. And Nilda votes yet. Yeah. Motion carries. <laughs> um, we're, at, we're at the section of 7D, and um, I would like to entertain a motion related to um, St. Albans City School principal. Who would like to make a motion? So moved. Or what is the motion? 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 Sorry. <laughs> I'm just yeah. It's okay, hun. Sorry. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, sorry. So uh, the motion would be to hire um, Stephanie Gagnon as the uh, St. Albans City School principal pending all appropriate final <laughs> check, et cetera and her acceptance of the position. There, there's some lingo, Bill, that usually goes in these. All, all, it's right there on the sheet. You want to read it, Nina? Yep, Nelda, I'll read it. The administration re recommends a motion to accept the recommendation to hire Stephanie Gagnon 
Canyons. 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 Okay. As St. Albans City School Principal, effective July 1st, 2023. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Jack. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion. Um, Grant. Yes. Jack. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Katie. We lost Katie. Lost Katie. We lost okay. Katie. All right, Nina. Yes. Peter. Yes. Susan. Yes. Neil DeVos, yes. I guess we have to say that that was, um, what, seven, six. six, zero? Yep. With one missing. Um, all right, next item on the agenda is. Okay. Can we just stop for a second and say congratulations, Stephanie? Yes. yes. Welcome. Sorry, Nilda, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what was that? <laughs> what did you say, you say, Nelda? Is Stephanie in the room? Yes, she yes. is. <laughs> oh, okay. My apologies. Um, I didn't know who was in the room. Thank you. We're back. At, yeah, we have everyone here. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Item 7E uh, revised. F23 capitalization of assets policy. This is a second reading. I'd like a, um, a motion to adopt the revised F23 capitalization of assets policy that was warned at the January 18th, 2023 board meeting, please. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Jack. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, Grant. Yes. Jack. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Katie. <laughs> yes. Nina. Yes. Peter. Yes. Susan. Yes. Nilda, yes. Okay, so that motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 7F. <clears throat> do, um, do we still have members um, are they still here, the two people that yes, were they are. looking? <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. So as everyone knows, we have two vacancies for the in the board um, on the city side, um, one due to Mr. Corey's passing and the other one due to Mr. Erickson's resignation. So the um, statute allows us to appoint persons in those positions to finish the term. Um, and if those persons get uh, appointed, they would have to obviously go and get uh, sworn in and then they could participate after they're sworn in to all um, activity up until um, the election. And then I believe the two people are also running for the positions. So if they were to um, be elected, then it carries from there. Does so anybody understand that? Anybody not understand that process? Okay, so we need to. Um, we need to talk about um, those two positions, and if, as I understand it, we have Charles Brooks and Susan Kenyon who are interested in those two positions. Am I correct? Yes, that's what we have. Uh, we have emails from both of them, and both of them are yeah. with us tonight. Yeah, we, and have emails, <laughs> we had emails in our packet that they expressed desire to, that they were running for the positions and also expressed desire to serve mm -hmm. as yep. an appointed member of the committee. Anybody have any questions for them since they're right in front of you? Can we ask why they're interested in running? Or being appointed to the board. I'm sorry I didn't hear that. Can I ask why they're interested in being appointed to the board? Can I ask what, please? Why they're, why they're interested 
in being oh, appointed yes, to the board? Yes, please do. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I have the pleasure of serving on the Board of Trustees of the and one at St. Albans Town School. Um, I'm a self-employed family and wedding photographer in St. Albans, and I am finally able to take the time to give back to my community, and that's why I am running. I'm pretty passionate about our schools. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Charlie Brooks, uh, uh, and uh, my interest in uh, running is, uh, or being on the Maple Run uh, School Board is uh, largely based around uh, sort of the fallout from uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, I have two kids uh, in, in city school, uh, and my wife is a substitute teacher there, and I'm interested in sort of the, basically the pandemic changed just about everything. Uh, and I'm interested in trying to help navigate the uh, landscape, landscape after that. Uh, and I've been taking a, an increasing part in the uh, affairs of the, the school as a result. Thank you. Um, I have one question for you guys. So the school board meets the first and third Wednesday of just about every month. Um, at six o'clock and the agenda says six to nine. We usually get out before nine, but I just wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that and that doesn't present a conflict for you generally. Obviously there will be some conflict on occasion because life happens, but in general, you don't have like your part-time job on Wednesday nights or anything like that, you know? So just wanna <laughs> make sure we clarify that. You don't have to answer the question. I guess I was just pointing it out. Anyone else in the room have questions for these guys? No, uh, no, I just have a comment. Yes, sir. And that is that I'm going to vote no on this. I'll vote for both of them in the back and when I go in the voting booth. But I just think at this point, it's so close. I don't think we should be appointing. You don't think we should be appointing just because it's only a month away, kind of? Exactly. Well, I thought we had discussed that at the last meeting. And I thought that was the flavor of the board but I guess I was mistaken. So that's just a personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You became muted. Okay, I'll vote for them both at City Hall, but I just think with one meeting to go, I, I think I'm gonna personally wait for the system to play itself out the way it was set up. Right. Nilda, Grant has a uh, hand up too, Nilda. Okay, Grant. Yeah, um, just and this may be actually a question for you and Neil, but uh, the way that we have it arranged on the ballot, right, we've got one city director um, for a three year term and one for the two years remaining on the one year term. H how does that work logistically? Do all uh, city candidates show up under both ballot items? All or do you run for one or do you run for one of those seats mm -hmm. or the other? All city candidates show up on every ballot, city, town, and Fairfield, mm -hmm. but they'll show up under the, they'll be listed under the community they're from, but it's commingled votes. So you have to get a majority of all the votes that are cast to, to win. So if two people are running and they're, they're shoo-ins, obviously, unless somebody you know, starts Nelda, to get right. Nelda, 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 wait a second. Nelda, that's, I think Grant's question was something different than what okay. you answered. Grant, was your question um, if they, do they appear both for the three-year term and the resolution of the two years that are left on a three-year term? Was that your question, right. Grant? That, that was my question. And the answer is no, they do not. They have to right. declare which one they're running for. Right. That is that is correct. Yes. I knew and I knew that so I guess answer my, too. <laughs> and so I guess my question, which may not have too much of a bearing on, you know, how to vote tonight, but are both of the potential appointees are they are they running for separate ballot items? I believe Thanks. so from the information I have from City Hall and how that was okay. turned right. in. Okay. Thanks. So I was just 
mainly curious. Yep. Right. Right. Thank you. Sorry about sorry about that confusion. Anyone else have any? Uh, yes, Susan. Yeah, I guess I'm um, gonna say that I, my understanding is the same as Peter's, which was I thought we were going to be putting this off until town meeting since there was only one meeting. I just point of clarification: there are two meetings before town meeting. Okay. I just want I'm just clarifying the meeting schedule. Okay. So, anyways, that's that was my understanding. So. <clears throat> putting that um, out there. I don't have any recollection of, of the conversation of holding off doing it. Not that I would have been you opposed. Weren't, you weren't there, Nilda, I don't believe, right? That was the meeting you weren't at. Well, what are the minutes state? Do the minutes state that? So, does Nilda, I, know? I think I was the I think I was the one that brought it up um, you know, and said, is it does it make sense to do this? Um, I don't think there was a clear answer. Um, I think that if you got people running for the school board and we have two seats available that are ostensibly up for appointment, it makes it would 100% make sense for those running to come out and say they want to be appointed. So <laughs> I have absolutely no problem following through uh, on the process tonight. Right, Joanna. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, that's how I heard it as well. And I think that, you know, we can discuss about voting, you know, whether or not votes can count on a budget, but they can, you know, sit and become aware and learn and be a part of the process. No, I don't think so. Okay. So, Joanna. I mean, just, um, no, uh, no, I have a, one thing. So, I was under the impression of them as well that we were just going to kind of wait um, just because I know we've been privy to you know, I mean, everybody has been, but to the ballot and, I mean, not to the ballot, to the, um, to the, everything coming out on the ballot and the, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just feel like sitting in on the last two might be difficult coming in on the next couple of votes that we have coming up, if that makes sense. So is Aaron still here? Yes. I mean, is there an opportunity to look at the minutes and see what the minutes say to this? That's what I'm doing right now. It doesn't say. I, I it, does, it doesn't say anything. It doesn't yeah. say anything specifically right. about holding off. I think we, we had a discussion, and then I, you know, I, I know we're coming down to the wire, but we still have to go through the process and to try to fill those seats. And I know it may not make sense, but we really need. We really, I know we discussed it, but I thought we, there was, we were going to just go through the process anyway. That was my understanding. But That was my understanding, so I continued with the announcement yep. as we did. So what's the next step? It, for your, to, the so recommendation is that there's a, a motion that I've given you in the annotated agenda that's a recommended motion to appoint uh, you'd have to do it separately for each individual. So there would be yeah. two motions for each seat. And do we know which seat each person is running for? Uh, it doesn't matter for the two, this month period. Right. It doesn't matter for the two month mm -hmm. period. Oh, okay. For this month period, yeah. Okay. They're just completing the vacancy. Okay. So um, just thinking this through, Bill and Grant yes. and Peter, who brought this up, in this particular situation, this is not going to matter. I could think of a situation if the players were different, that this would be a significant issue. So I think that if this comes up again, we need to, in the future, we need to think this through, you know, and you guys as administrators should, should remind us of that because it seems to be it's going to be the same people unless, like I said, we get somebody that, that embarks on a write-in campaign which, you know, probably won't happen. But if it was, if there were a bunch of people running and we were actually going to have a runoff, this, this could be a problem. So anyway, so I guess I'm, what I'm hearing you all say is we're going to carry on as we're planning and a point tonight. Do I have that straight? I think we're going to go okay. to vote at least. All right. So... Yes, thanks, Grant, for clarification. Okay, so um, we're recommending, I need a motion to appoint Charles Brooks 
as St. Albans City Representative on the Maple Run Unified School District until the 2023 <laughs> town meeting day um, elections conclude. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? <coughs> okay, so we're going to take a roll vote. Um, Grant? Yes. Jack? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Katie? She's no longer. Oh, she is. Sorry. Katie? You're on mute, Katie. She's telling us there's stuff going on in the background. Oh, She's having troubles yeah. again with her, her mic. Yeah. One. <laughs> She's trying. <laughs> Put us can you Katie, can you do a thumbs up or a thumbs down and the and they, they can clear, verify? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, my gosh, I'm so sorry. Okay, what I, I missed what this one was for. It logged me out again. So this is for um, Charles Brooks. Okay, I'm gonna say point. I'm gonna say no for right now. Okay. Um and uh, Nina. Yes. Peter. No. Susan. Yes. Neil the votes yes. So motion carries, uh, I think it's five zero. Five, five. no, five zero two. Five. Five two. Five two. Five two zero, excuse me. Um, all right. And then um, I would like a motion to appoint. I have her as Susie Brooks, but I think it's Suzanne. Is that correct? Suzanne, right? Kenya. Kenya, Ken 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 excuse me. Kenyan. Uh, yeah, my error. Suzanne Kenyon as a St. Albans City Representative on the Maple Run Unified School District Board until 2023 Town Meeting Day election concludes. May I have a motion? So moved. Thanks, Jack. Is there a second? I'll second. Thanks, Joanna. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Grant. Yes. Jack. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Katie. I'm going to say again, no. Okay, Nina. Yes. Peter. No. Susan. Yes. Nilda, yes. Okay, again, 521, motion carries. 520, motion <laughs> carries. <laughs> okay, moving on, we're on 7G, SEL Nilda, data can do, from- Nilda, can we just do a brief- can Congratulations and thank you for willingness to Yes. Us. Oh, thank I keep forgetting this. <laughs> thank you for take, taking care of my etiquette tonight because I can't see the room, the room across from you. So yeah. thank you for volunteering, Charlie and Susan, and we look forward to working with you. No. <laughs> Nilda, it's Suzanne, just to give you the heads up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and then 7G SEL data from fall 22 update. We have this in our attachment 7G. And yeah. Bill, I think you were gonna give us a sort of an intro to this and. Yes, um, so the board asked for, at the last meeting, asked for data from our SEL survey by school. I really wanna caution the uh, board members and the public who see this data we're more than willing to give it out by school. It is should not be used to compare schools. And I know people will want to do that. The schools sit in very different contexts. There's different students, different demographics, and different makeups at each school. So while we're willing, more than willing to give it, I just really, it's not a comparison tool. We use it as a growth tool to say, where was the school in the previous survey or the previous year? And we use it for that basis and try right. to really look at it from a strengths-based growth piece. Um, we There are more things that have had to be, um, <clears throat> we were able to keep some of all the demographic issues, but some we couldn't because of uh, student number, number mm -hmm. of students, when we break it down into some subgroups. Right. So um, 
We've given you all that. And what I would ask the board, because we have a lot of work to do and we're already at 820, if you would look at this over and the next board meeting come with any questions, I'd be glad to collect them and get you information. If you have questions in the meantime, I'd be glad to take them offline and get those prepared for the next meeting as well. I just know we have a lot to do today. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Okay, I think um, Nina, we're up to new business. Okay, uh, new business 8A, transportation bid award. Um, the administration recommends a motion to award the transportation bid to, is it Terrasso? Yeah. Terrasso Transit, contingent on receiving a bid waiver from the Agency of Education. And that's because they were the only one, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And Brianne King is here, our okay. assistant business manager to speak to. Okay. Um, okay, can I have a motion? <coughs> Make that motion. Can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you very much. Okay, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, so we had Terracell Transit as the only bidder. Um, we sent the proposal out to 13 different bidders, um, and they were the only ones who came back. Um, but we, they came back with great news, um, and. We've used them in the past and haven't had any issues. Um, so, are there any questions? I know you did some analysis here for the board, so I did. just a brief overview. Yes, so with the analysis, uh, the daily route is going up about 6.5% um, over the first year. The second year, they're going up an additional 8%, and the following year, it's another additional 8%. Um, and then the CIP daily shuttle is going up 12.8% and then it's staying stagnant the rest of the time. Um, and then the physical edge shuttle um, is going up 4.9% and then again, staying at the same amount. Um, as you can see, the daily cost for the after school um, program and the summer school is going up quite a bit. Um, but that's, I think, due to um, staffing shortages with Terracell, um, as we've seen. So. And how are the staffing, uh, is their staffing okay or are they still short? And I, I think they're still short um, and that's probably why they have a higher rate right, is yeah. because they probably have to pay a premium is my guess. So does this mean that it's going up from 23 to 236? It's going up by 50% the cost? Where are you Compares, looking? Like on the, on the far right hand, the very bottom, it says compared to the FY22. Okay, so that is the per hour field trip charge. Um, so it is going up um, for their hourly rate. So currently it's $19 an hour, um, and then it's gonna go up to $30 if it's less than 50 miles, or over 50 miles, and $60 if it's less than 30 miles, so. Well, can you just again uh, let the board know overall what's the contract percentage increase from this current year to next year and then this year to two years and next year to three Yep. So overall, um, with our daily analysis that we've done, yeah. um, it looks like from FY23 to FY24, it would be about 35.7% of an increase, but that is with um, factoring in um, summer school costs, um, after school and bus shuttling, um, and field trips as well. Um, but we don't know how much the schools are going to go on field trips um, in the future. So um, that's just comparing with how we daily use, right? Right. This year to yes. Previous years. Yeah. To that, and assuming. So yes. Grant. Yeah. Um, there's also the Company that we currently use, yes? Yes. That's correct. Yep. So it's Grand Dab. Do you know, oh, sorry. I was going to say, are there other bus companies that serve the area? Um, Grand Dab is the only Well, they don't like to infringe on uh, their other territories. Um, so, right. So, but they're the only ones who did place a bid. So, how do we, I think, probably what we do about this year, but how do we start to that long term? How do we place? At all the other bid. school districts who have gone out to bid this year have had the same problems. So, 
it's been really difficult. And are the are the pricings comparable? I Have honestly you, like, think looked that. looked at other, you know, sometimes Bill gets uh, data from yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. I, I will tell you, this, <clears throat> we're doing better than some of our neighbors next to us who get the same service. Yes. Okay. Oh, yep. There's one That's why we say we're happy more. with what Bree said. We're like, we're happy yeah. with what we got from what we thought yep. we were going to get. Okay. Yeah. That was my question because I heard you say that, but I was just looking at it. I'm just... Yeah, trying to yes. hear why yes. <laughs> you were happy. <laughs> yes, and I was happy, happy we got at least one bid. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. With the same yeah. service. Yeah. So. Grant. So it sounds like other other districts, although they're getting single bids, are applying for the same waiver. Yes. Yep. Yes, that's true, Grant. Yep. Grant, we're seeing this in the, it's a statewide issue that is happening that the transportation providers are pretty much carved up to the state. So is there anyone at the state level looking at how to work for that? If the board wanted to do that, I would suggest you contact the state auditors, state auditor. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thanks, Grant. Any other questions? Okay, I'll go ahead and make, uh, uh, go ahead and take a vote. Again, it's to award the transportation bid to Terracell uh, Transit contingent on receiving a bid waiver from the Agency of Education. Um, that's 8A, so Joanna? Yes. Uh, Nilda? Yes. Jack? Yes. Susan? Yes. Katie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Grant? Yes. And Nina? Yes. Uh, motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Okay. Um, 8B, certificate of project completion. Um, we need a motion for this for you guys. Okay. All right. This is, so this is the administration recommends a motion to approve the certificate of project completion. And this is just the completion for BFA and um, the connector. Uh, is that correct? Yes. This is, why don't you get the yep, motion yeah, first? Yeah, I just want to no. make sure. Yep. Okay. Can I have a motion, please? I'll make that motion. Thanks, Susan. Can I have a second? Second. Thanks, Jack. Okay. <laughs> this is, um, the board needs to certify that we completed the, um, work from the bond that we took from the bond bank, right? Martha, I should know that off the top yes, of my head. Yes, From the yes. bond bank um, that provided us the connector and the safety and security renovations that we started three and a half years ago at BFA, and we spent all the bond money. So this is our, the board needs to certify that we've done that, and Martha could tell you any more that needs to go with that. What was the final total on that? Yes. So the bond actually was yeah. uh, five million seven hundred and twenty-two thousand and change. <laughs> oh, it's not. Just, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Comments? <coughs> Anybody on Katie, Grant, Peter, Nilda? Nope. Okay. Um, go ahead and take a vote on that. Again, the administration recommend, recommends a motion to approve the certificate of project completion. Uh, Joanna? Yes. Nilda? Oh. Nilda? Yes. Okay. Jack? Yes. Susan? Yes. Katie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Grant? Yes. Nina? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much and, and good Martha, job. do you have a. We have a sign. There's a form that I need all of your signatures on. The one that's in here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Right. In the full right there. Okay. Okay. Go on. Yes, okay. please do. Yep. New business uh, under 8C, uh, early retirement request. It's attachment 8C. The recommendation, um, the, sorry, the administration recommends a motion to approve the early retirement request. Can you say the name? Yes. And who is that? It is Tony Gray. It, yep, sorry. The administration recommends a motion to approve the early retirement request from Tony. Tanya. Tanya, Tanya sorry, Tanya Gray. Gray. I just think of Tanya. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tanya Gray. Can I have a motion? It's actually Tony. It's huh? Tony Gray. It is Tony. Okay. Tony Gray. Sorry, my bad. Can I have a motion, please? Thank you. And Grant, thank you. Okay, any discussion? 
Uh, yes, and we may need to go into executive session for this, uh, but there's a letter in the packet uh, for Ms. Gray. Uh, she's been at BFA for 25 years. Um, and there is a, and she has come forward with a um, request for early retirement. Um, and she, I'm just trying, I'm thinking how much I can say in public open session that I don't want to. You all have the letter. She does a pretty good job there. I could tell you about, I'd want to tell you about some other things that in executive session if you need to have those details. I'm recommending it. I'm recommending it. Yep. Uh, just before I go on, do we want to invite Susan to come up here? Because she's on. Suzanne. She can't. She can't. Not she's yet. Not, she's oh, not, she, oh, she has she to do that thing. She has okay. to do her with the gotcha. office. Yep. She can participate in discussion. Gotcha. But, <laughs> okay. But yes, it's recommended. I they said that in the motion. In that recommended motion. I'm recommending it. Right, so um, this is always a kind of a bugaboo for me because you know we have that program in place and a deadline for folks to apply for early retirement. And I believe this is a request for early retirement on a prorated basis. But um, as you all know, there are situations that come up in people's lives that sometimes it makes sense to make the exception. So long as you know we're not setting any precedent and we have done this in the past, uh, over the years, and so therefore, I, I personally could approve this um, without having to go into executive session to get a whole lot more detail because the the administration recommends it. Anybody else have thanks, Nilda. Anybody else have any concerns, questions about this? Could you could you clarify? Is it <clears throat> on a basis or not? It's not. It's not. The letter would say it's the full 12. Say that again? It said it would be the full 12,000 because the letter says, it, the, our agreement says 25 years of service. Yeah. Yeah. It's not prorated. Well, wait a minute now. That's a little different than what we talked about. So maybe we need to go into executive yeah. session real quickly. Yep. Okay. Can I? All right. So we've already made the motion. So I just. No, you just, you just hold it. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll just hold it and we'll go into an executive session. Um, let's, should we finish up the rest? I would suggest you finish yeah, up. Yeah, let's finish up. <laughs> Nilda, do you want other business? You want me? <coughs> Sorry. It's yours. Okay. All right. We'll just move on and we'll save that for executive session. Um, <laughs> other business warrants, attachment 9A. The administration recommends a motion to approve the warrants, acknowledging that. Passage of this motion will act as authorization and signature of any individual board members particip participating remotely. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Oh, thank you, Susan and Joanna. Any discussion? Okay, um, go ahead and take a vote. Uh, Joanna? Yes. Uh, Nilda? Yes. Jack? Yes. Susan? Yes. Katie? I got the end of the thing, yes. <laughs> Peter? Yes. Grant? Yes. Nina, uh, motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. Uh, 9B, superintendent report? I'm just going to say 20 seconds, which is you're starting to get education legislation reports. I spent time with House and Senate Ed in the past week and a half. Uh, we've made a real push, and I say we because all the superintendents were doing it. We made a real press push for them to fund. Um, fully fund mental health through the social services because of how much we're having to take up on the education side. That's my briefest okay. I can do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, board announcements? <clears throat> Anybody have anything? I have a really quick question. Would it look like it's coming out of the education fund? fund? Right now we are because we're putting so much in the school system, we're taking it out of the ed fund. We're trying to get them to do what they had initially planned to do, but mm -hmm. they've, been de they've been defunding social services and it's been hurting. We've had to backfill with our own personnel. Okay. Yep. Um, I have one, and since this is the elephant in the room, Grant, happy birthday. <laughs> it's the elephant. Uh, that's the elephant. You're gonna say anything, so I figured I would. <laughs> happy birthday, Grant. <laughs> Any other board announcements? I have a question for Bill. 
That has been resolved. That was the yeah. governor signed it, and so as you gave us, it just asked for. I don't have the warrant in front of me, uh, so I don't want to mm -hmm. misquote it. But basically, it just has the approval of the total amount of the expenditure budget mm -hmm. without the percentage, without any yeah, of the, yeah. 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 the yeah. yeah, no percentages and no cost per equalized pupil. All right, and uh, number 10, agenda for future meetings. We have the non-political flag and the flagpole, um, which will be... Open, we can get that on the next one. Next, okay. Yep. All right. And then we do have an executive session uh, for 8C, so need a motion to go under, um, sorry, go into executive session for a personnel menu, uh, not menu, not <coughs> personnel, <laughs> but... Uh, Matter. 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 Sorry, thank you. Um, before, can oh. you hold? Can yeah. you hold for that? So, Bill, just when you said we hope, hoping to get that on the agenda for next time, and I just want to make sure that we're really mindful about how we put that on the agenda and and how we how we open that up for discussion. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Joanna. Okay. Still need a motion for executive session. Uh, so moved. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Joanna? Yes. Nelda? Yes. Jack? Yes. Susan? Yes. Katie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Grant? Yes. Nina, motion carries 7 0. We are in executive session. We are out of executive session. Um, so we'll go back to the motion of early retirement requests, uh, new business at 8C. The administration recommends a motion to approve the early retirement request of Tony Gray, um, we had a motion first and second in, so now we're able to vote. Um, 8C, okay, so Joanna? Yes. Nilda? She's muted. You're muted, Nilda. <laughs> Nilda, Nilda abstains. Abstains, okay. Jack? Yes. Susan? Yes. Katie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Grant? Yes. And Nina. Um, so motion carries six, huh? Six zero. Six zero one with abstain, sorry. All right. Um, and we are at the end of our um, agenda and we can adjourn. <laughs>